I'm here today with Professor Harold James, Professor of History and International Affairs at Princeton University, I'm here to discuss his new book, Making the European Monetary Union, published by Harvard University Press. Thanks for joining us, Harold. Thank you, Rob. So, this is a fascinating book because it begins through the archives and through the study of how this was created, why it was created, but we see so many fault lines evident today. When you go back to the beginning, could you see those fault lines in, in retrospect? Can you see those fault lines emerging? Can you see those flaws as the design is being contemplated? Well, what fascinated me really when I did the research for the book was the degree of accuracy with which those fault lines were identified in the technical discussions, not at the political level, but in the technical discussions between central bankers and advisors in the late 80s and early 90s. And in particular, uh, the two fault lines I think are really critical. One is to do with the question of fiscal rules in the monetary union, and the second to do with the question of how banks are supervised and regulated once you have a common capital market and a, a common monetary area. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you see the architects, the visionaries exploring and building this, mm -hmm. people who understand finance and economics, and, and they, they see what you might call the incompleteness of the design. Th th that's absolutely right. It's, 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 it's not complete. And you can really even follow this through the drafting process of the Maastricht Treaty. I, but I think it's ac actually fascinating. Mm -hmm. The d details are in the book about how the, the question of a supervisory role for the ECB that is at the forefront of all the discussion now was in the original drafts that the central bank has made for the ECB, mm -hmm. but then gets watered down as you go through the discussion so that there's still a vestige of it that exists in the Treaty of Maastricht, and it's useful in some ways at the moment, but it, it do doesn't and it didn't provide for the kind of banking supervision and regulation that you would really need on a cross-European basis. So you're, you're in a place where, at the mm. onset of this, the power mm. of banks in each nation means there's political power associated with the supervision of banks, and yes. ceding that to uh, a what you might mm. call a common European authority, was probably very painful, or, or many people were very reluctant to, uh, how do we say, relinquish the power that they had. I, I, I think that, that that's part of the story, yes, that there's, there's something, something political about how bank credit is allocated, and people are always worried that some countries are more dependent on bank credit than others, and so those, those countries would then be disadvantaged if you move uh, to a a common regulatory system. But it's also, I think, um, a actually a symptom of the times that this was a general view in the 1990s that the primary task of central banks was to focus on price stability. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's when the modern discussion of inflation targeting begins. Yes. So it's not just a European development. It's just that the Europeans carried that particular development, I think, further than most other countries did. And at the outset, mm -hmm. or the vision envisioning of the ECB and this mm -hmm. question of financial or monetary rules, you have at the center the German, the Deutsche Bundesbank. Mm -hmm. And they had an experience that suggested mm -hmm. to them focusing on anything but price stability was, yes. was tempting fate. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's curious, you know, I'm a historian, so I like looking back at these long periods of hi history. And right at the beginning, when the first German central bank was created in the middle of the 1870s, it was actually as a response to a financial crisis. And mm -hmm. so one of its primary tasks uh, was exactly financial sector stability. And mm -hmm. that remained a responsibility of the, this original uh, bank, the prototype of the Bundesbank, the Deutsche Reichsbank, um, until the 1920s. Um, but it led the Reichsbank to do really terrible things in the inflation. And mm -hmm. so the, the modern <laughs> concept of German central bank is very much a response to that, that this kind of inflation experience indicates what happens if a central bank gets too close to business, too close to the state, and too close to the banks as well. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, mm -hmm. by contrast with the ECB, mm -hmm. they've taken a much more aggressive role in uh, what you might call balance sheet expansion. Yeah. Yeah. And that resistance at mm -hmm. the ECB, 
in comparison with the U.S., mm -hmm. is probably a reflection of those historic learnings or, or scar tissue that emanate from the experience in Germany. Yes, uh, I, 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 I think that's right, although the e ECB has also really moved very, very extensively into the area of liquidity provision. Yes. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it's a parallel it's story after 2008. And then it moves further and further, and with the uh, OMTs, the outright yes. monetary transactions, it's actually moving very far into the kind of U.S. terrain, yeah. and that's in turn provoking a great deal of discussion I was gonna say, in, the, in, the, in the German context. Comparing the Mario Bundesbank. Draghi to Faust is, uh, right. is the byproduct of the tensions uh, right. in the debate. Although I think, I think as a kind of footnote to that, it's, it's kind of not really so well understood uh, because you, you think if you just read that, that little bit of Faust um, that money creation comes from the devil. Uh, but actually the big context of Faust is that the devil does useful work and that good is created <laughs> out of the work of the devil. So the, the, the devil announces right at the beginning, Mephistopheles announces, I'm the, the power that wants bad, but actually in the end always creates good. And mm -hmm. so uh, you know, I think there is another way of reading even mm -hmm. Goethe's Faust. We'll call this mm -hmm. segment Sympathy for the Devil. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, going back to the beginning, you mm -hmm. say that the designers, the technicians, mm -hmm. can see the fault lines. Mm -hmm and yet they implemented the system. So the, what you might say, if people see a flawed design, you can do one of two things. Mm -hmm. Kill it or continue to evolve the design. But at some point, they implemented the URL with the knowledge that it was not, uh, how we say, a complete or coherent system. Mm -hmm. Why did they do that? Did, did they have faith that they could evolve it over time? Did they feel that uh, there were political imperatives that made it necessary to how you say, shove off from shore? What, what, what were the pressures? No, I mean, you, you, you do make it sound as if it's a kind of aeroplane with a design flaw that yeah. goes down the runway and they don't know how to, how to land it or how to fly <laughs> it properly in some circumstances. And uh, I, I mean the, the thing I think with every human institution is that it's constantly being modified and mm -hmm. actually many people thought this at the beginning you know they said for instance the fed when it was designed and when the fed began work in 1914 it really had design flaws as well oh and yeah. uh, so it really takes until the 1930s and the 1933 banking act before the fed's problems uh, uh, yeah. uh, improved uh, or uh, fixed, and so uh, unlike an aeroplane, you can you can tinker with the thing as it goes. So it's not an all or nothing uh, result. And, and and you know the other thing I think that is really crucial is that um, it was hard to see in the 1990s that banks were going to grow at the really explosive pace that they did mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. late 90s and in the 2000s, and that you got this enormous balance sheet expansion of the European banks. And maybe some people saw that in the sense that. European banks probably hoped that this integrated capital market would give them advantages and that they would grow and, and, and expand. Uh, but uh, obviously that's, that's in the future. And if you think of the banking world in the early 1990s, it's much more limited. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a quite interesting little collapse that takes place right while this is being discussed, the collapse of the uh, Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI. Yes. Um, and uh, at the time, People treated BCCI as a really extraordinary and unusual thing that was a kind of freak and probably had uh, obviously uh, fraudulent and criminal intent behind it, mm -hmm. um, and that it was untypical of the world of banking. But it actually, in some ways, BCCI was the future of banking. And right. The banks That's really right. emerged in that direction. And, yeah. and the, uh, in my own work, the uh, questions mm -hmm. of cross-border banking resolution mm -hmm. and the questions of derivative instruments being embedded mm. in uh, as OTC products into the balance sheets of mm. funds that had access, to, or excuse me, of institutions that had access to the funds through the discount window, or uh, the question of the intertwined nature of these large, too big to fail banks. Similarly, in that realm, by mm. 1998, 1999, 2000, mm. the BIS, the Financial Stability Forum, several central bankers, IMF, Capital Markets Group, were writing about those fault lines. Yes. 
and they were starting to identify. Uh, I remember uh, a German mm -hmm. scholar, Alfred Steinherr, mm -hmm. wrote a book called Derivatives, mm -hmm. The Wild Beast of Finance. Yes. And uh, so you can see sometimes that experts can see, but it, yes. doesn't, it doesn't lead to changes in design and practice. I mean, there's another, another really big, actually political question here, because if you're thinking of banking supervision and r regulation, you also really have to think about the circumstances in which there's a failure and a big institution collapses, and you have to think of the kind of resolution mechanism that mm -hmm. you would have. But the resolution mechanism, because of the fiscal capacity that's demanded for a banking resolution, really could only be the business of the member states, of the nation states mm -hmm. in the Eurozone, in the mm -hmm. monetary union, and not the affair of the, the collectivity of the EU or the Eurozone as a whole, yeah. because it didn't have enough fiscal capacity to do that. Right. And that, 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 I think, is a, a flaw that is now recognized. I mean, this is very much part of the banking yeah. union At some level, discussion. Uh, mm. The Euro, European-wide Eurozone mm. integrated region becomes a platform for much bigger banks, yes. but if the protection, yeah. the solvency protection of the, which you might call the tax base, mm. is, it, is the size of Ireland or Portugal, it, it yeah. can't support such things. Yeah, I mean, I mean this is, uh, you know, it's obviously the case for, for small countries, so it's the, the, the case for yeah. Ireland or uh, for, for, for Cyprus, even Switzerland. Uh, but for, uh, yeah, I mean Switzerland. But even for Germany, if you think of the balance sheets of the big, big German mm -hmm. uh, banks, if they have problems, it's really also a question that it would be difficult for yes. Germany to resolve. Yes, and as we've talked about uh, in the past, the European system mm -hmm. is somewhat different than the American system. The European system mm -hmm. is much more bank intermediated and less yeah. through securitization. And as a result, the asset or liability to GDP ratios within Europe are much higher. Mm -hmm. And the composition of liabilities depends much more on purchase liabilities and less on deposits, mm -hmm. which are considered more stable and uh, less likely to fly. Uh, so it, it creates a very fragile system where that public support, that contingent guarantee, becomes yeah. essential to stability uh, of particular institutions and of the system as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I mean this, is, this is something that uh, I, I think becomes a big issue in the, in the financial crisis. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clearly identified in retrospect this dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my colleague here in Shins has written quite extensively about this issue of the d dependence of the European banks on funding from money market funds in the United States. Right. And so they, they, I mean, this creates the, the direct interdependence of the European system and the US system mm -hmm. that, that means that the US financial crisis really explodes in a devastating way in the European context. Mm -hmm. One of our uh, grantees that mm. I met, a man named David Tuckett, mm. he's trained as a psychotherapist and he studies his book, The Mind mm. of the Market, he studies the uh, ways in which which might call subjective conjectures, what he calls fantastic objects, come to be formed, inspire action, and then when they're realized not to be quite so fantastic, uh, how I say, what ensues, it's like a boom bust kind of model of psychology. Hmm. What are the kind of myths that surrounded the formation of the euro? What were the fantastic objects that people envisioned when they embarked on this path and built this system? And what are the false myths that you uncovered in writing this book? <coughs> it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, I think both are very powerful myths that were around for a long time, uh, but are really treated uh, with uh, great seriousness and alarm now. Um, focus on the role of Germany in the creation of the system. So the, the, the German contribution is really essential. In the, the, the virtuous myth, uh, this is a political story that's driven by German concerns about the peaceful development of Europe. And so uh, Germans think that they don't ever want to have a war with France again. And so they have to make all kinds of incredible mm 
institutional links to mm -hmm. tie them to France and mm -hmm. to make this, uh, and pe people often like the image of a marriage in this context, but it seems to me an odd one. You know, if you really have violent quarrels with somebody, you, I wouldn't think, would be well advised to get married to them <laughs> in order to, to get over those quarrels. Yeah. Uh, but, but this is a myth that's really taken seriously, I think, both by proponents of the euro and uh, people who made it, like Hans-Dietrich Genscher, and by critics of the euro, like mm -hmm. uh, Marty Feldstein, who, who says uh, this was primarily always a political project and the economics of it was just not well thought out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's the kind of uh, vicious German myth as well that... Uh, uh, was identified a long, long time ago by the British politician Dennis Healy uh, that presented the euro and or the previous efforts at closer monetary cooperation in Europe as a kind of German conspiracy to lock in permanent export advantages mm. Uh, mm. by creating a more competitive currency for the Germans relative to their neighbours that would guarantee permanent advantages. But it seems to me that this is also a, a really problematic story in the sense that it's hard to see that this would be really a recipe for long-term success, long-term success. Um, it's, it's more a, a kind of beggar thy neighbor policy, and uh, when, when it really uh, functions like this, when there are big German surpluses, that's exactly when it creates the mechanism to do new institutional things in Europe. So German surpluses, which we think of a lot today, are not something that are unique to the world of 2012, uh, but they were in the late 60s and the late 70s and the late 80s. In each case, they pushed uh, th some kind of argument about how you need a European mechanism in order to get adjustment in mm -hmm. the European context. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at the current circumstance and things are quite in disarray. Mm -hmm. We have the technicians that you referred to earlier mm -hmm. as seeing fault lines emerging. But one of the things I hear over and over again was that the politicians of Europe, the political leaders, finance ministers, prime ministers, and what have you, were very late to recognize in the aftermath of, say, Lehman Brothers in 2008, that these fault lines were, which you might call, coming to the surface, and that they had mm. to repair the system, get ahead of the curve, and, and we still seem to be struggling with that. How, how do you see that? How does that uh, why is the recognition so difficult, or is that, a, is that another myth? Do they recognize it, but they don't know how to do something that's common for Europe at this time? I mean, I think with the crisis, it's, it's always easier to say that the crisis comes from somewhere else and from outside and that mm -hmm. somebody else is to blame. And there's, a, there's an element of, uh, you know, there's this German word, schadenfreude, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in this, that... Uh, in 2007, 2008, Europeans looked at the United States and saw the, the Lehman story and uh, the lead up to Lehman as a uniquely American story. And they didn't really yes. think of the, the way in which the European and the US systems were linked in this globally connected market. Um, mm. So that's, that's part of the story. Um, uh, I, I think also uh, part of the story is just the institutional complexity of trying to deal with this, which is in part a problem of the Eurozone and in part a problem of the EU when the architecture is really very unclear about the fiscal capacity. The Eurozone itself has no fiscal capacity and so when we think in historical terms of monetary unions being part of a, a political regime where there's also some measure of fiscal union the Eurozone has absolutely no capacity to do this. People didn't assume that this was an issue at first because mm -hmm. the uh, story of the uh, Treaty of Maastricht is that everybody except for Britain and uh, Denmark would sign up for eventual membership of the currency union. And so the non-Eurozone members of the EU are obliged to join the Eurozone in the end. And so it's assumed that the the EU has the fiscal capacity. But anyway, the fiscal capacity is small compared to what you would need, I think, as the counterpart. Mm -hmm. And that also was recognized in these discussions of the early 1990s. I mean, I find it absolutely fascinating that Jacques Delors, the president of the commission, when he's discussing this in the late 80s, uh, thinks that a fiscal capacity of the, the European Union of about 3% of GDP 
would be about what you would need to get some kind of stabilizer effect from mm -hmm. a central fiscal union. That's almost exactly the peacetime share of federal expenditure of GDP in the 19th century U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. So it looks like the U.S. story, uh, obviously in the 20th century, the, the federal budget expands. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's much bigger than the 1% which the EU budget was then in the late 80s and early 90s, and astonishingly still is now. Mm. Mm. The, uh, the situation now, you see Greece under stress mm -hmm. now, uh, you see Spain almost, how I say, trepidatious about mm -hmm. what happens to Greece and Italy. There's kind of a, a domino-like anxiety mm -hmm. of, of contagion. Do you see people putting together the institutional response based on that awareness regarding banking and fiscal union in response to the what you might call the scope and scale of distress now, or do you still see it as begrudging or halting and something that could fall apart? It, it, it is halting because of the, the imperfect institutional mechanism, and in particular, I think as long as this is always discussed in terms of national transfers from one member country of the European Union to another, it's bound to raise the kind of issue that you see in the, in the creditor countries in mm -hmm. uh, Germany, but also uh, very strongly in Finland, um, about yes. why should we pay for mistakes that are made for, for by somebody else. Yeah. Um, I think there is a need for the, the, those kind of transfers, but they're much easier to do if they're made, say, in the context of a common social security system, when they're not then transfers between national units, but transfers to individuals who can move, uh, mm -hmm. so that they would be entitlements that individuals could take around with them in the context of the integrated labor market, which is also part of the EU vision. Well, I've often said that growing up in mm -hmm. Detroit, had they bottled up all 3.2 million people when the auto industry went down in the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. it would have been socially chaotic and, mm -hmm. and the capacity for all of us to move, primarily within yeah. the United States, but to disperse, led an awful lot of the, how do I say, it was part of the adjustment. And mm -hmm. Bob Mundell, who wrote the uh, first paper I read on optimal currency unions, talked about a necessary condition being mm -hmm. labor mobility within that union. Yes, I mean that's that's very important for the the uh, this uh, literature on uh, optimal currency areas, and indeed it, it, it is true that um, you need to think of the factors that make for mobility in the United States. Um, there's a linguistic commonality as well that makes things easier. But I, th I think uh, you can see many many Europeans who move and who want to move, and one of the things that really holds them up is the the question of having different social security entitlements mm -hmm. if they work in one country and then in another country and then in a third country, uh, you would end up with a crazy patchwork, a kind of quilt of di little bits of different entitlements. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to, to simplify and to homogenize that, I think, would be a major achievement. Um, you know, maybe it's one of the things that people will think about in the, in the reaction uh, to the crisis, but it really requires a longer-term vision. Uh, this is not something that's going to happen immediately. Italy struggled for decades with this issue about mm -hmm. how to have a common social security <coughs> system. And that's just within mm -hmm. one nation. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, but with big disparities. So it, yes, I mean, in a sense, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a kind of it's a prototype. little model <laughs> of... Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I think uh, many of the, the larger countries that make up the European Union do come out of these very diverse traditions and uh, you know, have had a struggle themselves with this issue of fiscal transfers between regions. Mm -hmm. And in those areas in Italy uh, or in Spain or in Germany, th th these mm -hmm. are controversial issues. Mm -hmm. Well, German unification mm -hmm. is a very powerful, in terms of scale, as yeah. a case in point. I, I, I mean, it, it may well, I, I think, uh, be one of the features that makes Germans very worried about large transfers uh, on the governmental level, in the German case it's regional transfers from the western states to the eastern states in the, mm -hmm. in the 1990s and the, mm 
the legacy of that, that you know, you've got uh, uh, very, very beautiful roads and a good public infrastructure, but it didn't stop the drain of people out of eastern Germany. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that has interested me is how the international monetary system functions. There's kind of like a, a, a global system and then an intra-European system mm -hmm. within. And it seems, as I followed this debate since I was a student, first of Charles Kindleberger and then Peter Kennan and Bill Branson, mm -hmm. that there's always a yearning for order. But when you believe you have order and, th and the design is flawed, it sometimes creates chaotic conditions yeah. that are, how they say, uh, almost like the devil gives you your due. It's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an irony that in the yearning for order, everybody is now in such turmoil in mm -hmm. Europe. And uh, is it possible to create order through a, what you might call a system of commerce or price agreements? And is it, in particularly, is it possible to have very, very large-scale, short-term capital mobility and be consistent with that order. I mean, this, this, is, this is really the, the issue that the Europeans were actually trying to grapple with in the late 80s and in the early 90s in designing the monetary union. And one of the themes of the book is precisely this issue of the connection of European attempts at integration and European attempts a closer cooperation with a sense that something had gone wrong in the international system. And so the European story is often a substitute for a greater global coordination or mm -hmm. it's a reaction to things that go wrong in the international economy. So the first great push is in the late 60s and the crisis of the Bretton Woods system. Right. The second great push is in the late 1970s when there's a feeling that the United States is managing the dollar for political reasons. Mm -hmm. And the third great push is after the essentially the failure of international coordination uh, discussions in the middle of the 1980s between the, the Plaza meeting in, to, in 1985 mm -hmm. and the Louvre meeting in 1987. That, that really doesn't produce any kind of agreement. And the Europeans then say, if there isn't agreement on the global level, uh, then we will try to do this on the European level. Mm -hmm. And they very much thought, I think, about this as a story of reacting to, responding to, managing the globalization that was being produced by capital movements. And mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they sold, essentially, the uh, European monetary integration as a model for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And as a stabilizing mm -hmm. force right. within the, the region, which could yes. then be extrapolated to the larger and context. And what's, what's destabilizing, then, are these just enormous uh, financial sector movements in the 90s and the 2000s. Mm -hmm. it, it feels to me a little bit, as a, when you study finance, mm -hmm. I've often said, by the way, that uh, the window into economic history is to understand that there is no terminal equilibrium in a financial model. That most great financiers, you know, the Soros or mm -hmm. the Buffett or mm -hmm. Seth Klarman or others, when they write, Bernard Baruch, when they write, they write about how the art of the whole thing is that the future isn't anchored. There is no place to, what you might call, do backward induction into the present. Yes. And so the system is quite chaotic, which mm. creates the yearning for order, mm -hmm. but it also creates, uh, how would I say, the belief in that equilibrium as a way of modeling the world creates uh, what you might call a disregard for institutions and a disregard for the things that create what you might call viscosity or stability mm -hmm. in an uncertain world. And I've often said this is where the study of history reemerges because theory is so inadequate. And pe people are then always tinkering with institutions and trying to make the institutions adapt to yeah. what are very, very radically changing circumstances. And mm -hmm. you know, often we're stuck with institutions that are really deeply imperfect because they haven't kept pace with the technology, the scope of the, uh, the, the, um, you know, the, the evolution of the financial markets. But, 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 but exactly, I mean, I think this is this is. Uh, uh, Ab absolutely critical area in this that um, 
uh, here uh, you you have uh, a, a kind of sense of a, a, a system that's that's got out of control and uh, that it needs some kind of governance or some kind of rules mm -hmm. uh, in order to create the trust and the confidence that can make it work again in a in a in a, in a less destabilizing way. So in your earlier work on the creation and destruction of value, was it called the globalization mm. cycle? Yes. <coughs> you spoke, uh, you compared mm. the 2008 crisis to the 1931 banking mm. crisis rather than the 1929 stock market crisis. And in that, you talked about the destruction of values mm. as the stability and the confidence in the financial sector began to deteriorate. And uh, I, you, I remember you had very broad-ranging awareness of mm. the changes in art and the changes in uh, commerce and the many dimensions of this, what you might call the psychological environment were, uh, were fundamentally uh, challenged in that context. I, I absolutely. I, this was an interpretation of the Great Depression as a phase of deglobalization when the, the, the work really elaborate rules that had been created in the world of the 1920s, but they were inadequate to deal with the instability of the mm -hmm. 1920s, and they, they collapsed. Mm -hmm. And they collapsed in a world then where people thought more and more in terms of renationalizing everything and putting things back onto the level of national governments or even subnational units. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, there's a kind of fragmentation that occurs, yeah. and that's what I see as the still the frightening threat. Uh, in the, the present the, context. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, you, know, you see it very much in the reaction to these big, big uh, uh, cross-border institutions in Europe and the, the lending uh, in many, many countries. And then national governments that are trying to regulate the banks that have been involved in this and saying, no, no, you should come back and really lend more to your national customers, more, lend more to British customers if you're a British bank or French customers mm -hmm. if you're a French bank, mm -hmm. German customers if you're a German bank, and not do the kind of international lending that was the, the hallmark of this, this era of expansion. Yeah, no, there's a great deal of concern now about the Central and Eastern European countries, okay. uh, parts of Latin America mm -hmm. parts of Asia, mm -hmm. where the capital markets are not so well developed, and as the banks retrench, the uh, real consequences can be quite severe. Well, I mean, these, these are countries uh, in Eastern Europe or also in Latin America where the banking system got extensively put under foreign ownership in the course right. of the 1990s and the 2000s. And it's exactly that foreign ownership that is now so problematic. It's retrenching. Mm -hmm. yeah. The light that you can shed on current circumstances with history, whether mm -hmm. through the archival and uh, interviews and, and conceptual work that you've done regarding the European Union, or with regard to the Great Depression. I think this is a great model for our young scholars, and it's a great plug, how would I say, for the vitality mm -hmm. and the importance of economic history as another way of seeing and coming to understand uh, economic and financial phenomena. And uh, how would I say, I'm grateful for your work, and, uh, and I'm glad you came in to see us today. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you, sir.